Released in 1997 for the Sony PlayStation by a studio named Love Delic, we have Moon, Remix RP- Okay, that's- that's the wrong Moon. Okay, that's still the wrong Moon. Okay, no, that- I need the video game Moon. Why is Call of Duty here? Moon Remix RPG Adventure. Now I hear what you're thinking, what, what do all those extra words mean? Well, you see, Moon is what some people might call an anti-RPG, meaning it's an old-school role-playing game that subverts the tropes and the mechanics of the genre. Uh, games like Undertale and Earthbound, you know, an anti-RPG could be a parody or a satire of RPGs, a deconstruction of the mechanics and tropes, but at the end of the day, they still have enough of an RPG to be one. And Moon's extra special, because whereas other games would make alterations and changes to the combat and leveling systems of the genre, Moon went the extra mile. It just removed combat entirely. Yep, this is an RPG with no combat whatsoever. No experience points, no unlockable skills, no party system, no stat blocks. Moon never released outside of Japan, probably because it didn't have enough guns or depth to appeal to Westerners. So for years, you could only play this game through emulation, unofficial fan translations, making it a bit of a mystery discussed only in the most niche of circles. That is, until Moon was re-released worldwide for modern consoles in 2020. So now we can finally see for ourselves just what this bizarre game is all about. Starting up Moon, we first see a small boy getting up to play a video game. But he's not just playing anything, he's playing Moon. The game that we're playing right now, that's some Inception level shit right there. And not only that, he's skipping all the expository text at the beginning! So only now while making this video do I know what any of this stuff says. So after first picking our name, we can begin our quest as the Hero of Prophecy, summoned to slay an evil dragon who's eaten the moon or some shit, and plans to bring chaos to the lands and I, uh, it's just... Listen, it's all very convoluted. I mean, just look at how long some of these screens of text are. This whole segment is a very clear parody of RPGs, and it's very ridiculous. And not only that, like, the moment you leave the castle and go into the town, you just get attacked by a dog. Like, just a normal dog. And, and like, one of the NPCs even just gives you, like, in-game legendary armor. Like, immediately. Just, like, for free. But my favorite part has got to be the fight against the slime. Now, you don't actually get control any of the turn-based combat during this part of the game. It's more like a cutscene, but basically the slime and the hero will just hit each other for one damage over and over again, until the hero gets fed up and just casts a lightning spell on and kill it. But don't worry, it wasn't for nothing. We got a whole five experience points! Wowee! Now, the developers of Moon really liked making fun of RPGs and some of their, like, ridiculous tropes and over-the-top story beats. But it should be said that, like, all of this comes from a pretty clear place of love. Uh, you see, a lot of the people at Love Delic that worked on Moon were former employees of Squaresoft, and they worked on games like Romancing Saga 3, Chrono Trigger, and like even Super Mario RPG. So it really feels a lot more like they're laughing at former works that they've done than just mocking the genre as a whole, which is really nice. So the game continues on like this for a while, playing as the hero and killing things, eventually getting the dragon, when suddenly it cuts back to the little boy. Stop playing that game and go to bed. He complies and starts to go off when suddenly the TV turns itself back on and the game boots up again. When he goes to see what's happening, he gets sucked into the game. Oh, fuck, it's an isekai. It's like one of my Japanese animes. So, for the uninformed, isekai is a genre of Japanese storytelling in which a character is transported, displaced to an alternate world in which they have to navigate or survive. Either from magic, being reincarnated after dying, or, well, more often than not, getting hit by a truck. Now, this is an extremely popular genre among anime, manga, and light novels in Japan to the point that it feels extremely oversaturated today. In fact, Moon's one of the first few examples, actually, where the fantasy world aspect is presented as a video game, with Moon releasing a whole five years before other big franchises like Dot Hack or Sword Art Online even came out, meaning Moon's somewhat of a pioneer of the genre. This is actually pretty cool when you think about it. I mean, yeah, it's pretty overdone nowadays, but like this was like the one of the first times anyone has ever done this. And it's a game that never got released over here. So back to the game, we get sucked into the screen and we appear in Moon World, which 
surprisingly, looks nothing like when we were playing it in the prologue as the hero. Everything has a more pre-rendered early 3D kind of look to it. The boy that we're playing as is completely invisible to the townspeople, but we can still listen in on them and gather information. Uh, so we find out that the hero is just a part from Dragon's Castle. In fact, we can even see him running through town on occasion. He's chasing after the monster dog that he fought, but it's just like a normal dog. So he's just chasing around this dog trying to kill it throughout the town. He's just a public menace. So we leave the castle town and come out in some woods where we find this lonely little cottage. There's an old woman inside with the dog that was being chased by the hero earlier. And she's the first NPC that actually seems to be able to notice our presence. In fact, she even knows our name and claims to be our Gramby. She talks about how much she's missed us and hasn't seen us in forever, and invites us in and gives us a warm bed to sleep in. She tells us about how much she's missed us and she loves us dearly, and she's so glad for us to be back. She even gives us some clothes to wear so that people can actually see us. Now I know what you're thinking. Weasel, why are you taking advantage of this poor, senile, blind old woman? You're clearly not her missing grandson. Well, in my defense, my mother taught me to listen to my elders. It's not identity fraud, it's respect. I mean, come on, why would my Gramby lie to me? That night, however, we are visited in a dream by the god of Moon World, who, well, kind of looks like one of the defunct toys from Rudolph. She explains to us the importance of love within Moon World and instructs us with collecting as much of it as we can to increase our love level. Only then, can we open the door of light and save the citizens of Moon World? So how the hell do we do that? So every character in Moon has the love that we can acquire. Uh, essentially they have their own side quest for us to complete. Sometimes it's something simple, like just listening to someone talk about their passions and dreams, and sometimes we have to complete a more complex puzzle or sequence of events. A good example of this is the first love we acquire after waking up. Granby gives us some money and asks us to go buy her some bread from the baker in town. Because she's just too old and decrepit to make the trip herself. Just look at her. Mere moments from turning the dust in the wind. Joking aside, this does a good job of establishing what the core moon's puzzles are about. Collecting items and showing them to people. In a way, Moon seems to have a lot more in common with point-and-click adventure games than other RPGs from the time. There are so many different pieces of junk for you to collect in this game, and most of which I have no idea what to do with. Like seriously, this is just a homeless man's trash that they gave me. What am I supposed to do with this? A big part of Moon, though, is information gathering. You have to collect items and show them to the right people to gather the right information to learn how to gain love. Sometimes, you might just get some flavor text that has no real use. And other times, you'll gain important clues to solve a major complex puzzle that you won't reach for another 10 hours or so of gameplay, and by then you're just gonna forget about it. Yeah, you're gonna wanna play this game with a notebook, probably. But what do I need love for, I hear you asking? Well, apart from keeping the depression away, it also raises your stamina meter. You see, since there's no monsters or dungeons in the moon, the developers need to find something to serve as an obstacle. And it turns out that obstacle is unknowingly walking until you pass out. So this is something that confused me at first, but if we pause the game and go to the status screen, we can see a heart meter represents how much stamina we have left. This heart meter works like a timer. You can slightly replenish it by eating food, but if it depletes before you get back to a bed to sleep, you pass out and get the game over. Sent back to the last time you rested. The heart meter increases with each love level, and eventually you can actually go several days straight without having to rest. Apparently in early builds of the game, the heart meter is up in the top left corner of the screen, eventually getting replaced though in the modern build with this weird clock doohickey setup. It's kind of weird to try to understand, but fortunately the whole manual was uploaded online by the developers. This is neat, and I kind of wish more developers would do this with modern games. There's also a day-night cycle and a seven-day week cycle of certain events happening depending on the day of the week or time. Which is where the first real problem on Moon comes into play. 
Damn, this game can feel really monotonous at times. The only way to skip time forward is by resting in bed, but unlike modern games where you can pick how long you will sleep, you just sleep for a flat amount of time. So I need to talk to this specific person at this specific time on a specific day, but oops, I didn't time things right, so now I gotta turn around and walk all the way back to my bed before I pass out again. Even after getting my stamina meter up to near max, I still had this problem. There's just nothing fun about waiting around for four days for the one event you need to happen, because you missed it the first time. And then I have to do a walk of shame all the way back to my house to try again next week. And good lord, is there a lot of walking. Which only made more infuriating when you can't figure out what to do next. Just going back and forth between the same locations over and over again. There's a fast travel system in the game, but it's extremely limiting. It's just a one-way trip from your house to one of three locations around the map, and oh yeah, you can get a house in this game. And before you ask, no, I did not con another senile old woman out of this. It was given to me by a weird old man for free. You get the house pretty early on, it's certainly useful. It's located closer to the center of the map than Granby's house, and it has the unlockable fast travel point I mentioned. Don't worry about the guy hogtied to the post. He's fine, living his dreams. Much like the dead president inside my bedroom. Speaking of which, there's one other way to acquire love in this game, and that's necromancy. You see, the hero is grinding XP to kill the dragon. Only problem with that, all the monsters are actually just harmless animals. See that slime he killed in the beginning of the game? That was slime. He had hopes and dreams. Or he got fried by holy lightning. Well, at least his girlfriend Schleim is okay, and dang it, she's dead too. That's alright though, because we can resurrect them by catching their souls and returning it to their body. Each animal has a different puzzle for reaching their souls. Sometimes something simple like this bat that only appears for brief moments at night. But then there's Toto Taruri. That requires you to sign up for a Duolingo account so you can trip on shrooms and gather his individual soul shards. I hated this part of the game. So yeah, some of these puzzles get a little complicated, which is made worse by the fact it's all really open-ended. Sometimes just figuring out where to go or what to do next can be difficult. There's nothing more frustrating than walking back and forth across the map over and over again just to hit another dead end. So yeah, Moon can be very frustrating at times. It can feel extremely dated design-wise, but I don't know, I just can't help but like this game. There's just so much charm tucked into every little corner and all the characters. The king is practically a child with this innocent demeanor. His reform plans for the kingdom looks like they were drawn with crayons. Some of the environment designs look absolutely beautiful, and in my opinion, the pre-rendered backgrounds hold up really well. There's a lot of detail to them. The animals are all made in clay art, and they get abducted by a UFO whenever you save them. You can go fishing and catch a little refrigerator and then sell it in the store for less money than a tin can. At one point I got scolded by a feminist for spying on a girl while she slept. The hero's legendary armor was just a woman's lingerie. I even found like a little girl who's a little too interested in her pet dog. The game's just really funny and charming. Now I don't want to spoil too much about the game, because I feel like a lot of the appeal of games like Moon, Undertale, Lisa, or Earthbound is in finding bizarre character scenarios for yourself, and I don't want to diminish that for anyone watching by going into too much detail. This is really a sort of game that you should experience for yourself. But if you do play it, please do the Baker's Quest. It changes a man. Moon is certainly not a game for everybody. It can be very frustrating and sometimes even boring at times, but I think I'm okay with that. It reminds me of the first time I played the original Legend of Zelda, or the multiple attempts I made at playing the La Mulana series. It's so easy to get lost in these games and just bang your head into the wall for hours without making any progress, but when you finally manage to fit all the pieces together, there's just something so satisfying about it. I don't know, drawing out game maps and recording notes can make the game feel like a chore, but it delivers a unique experience that most games aren't willing to offer anymore. I mean, so many games nowadays spoil the puzzles for you outright. Even just walking back and forth between the same location for hours in this game? I don't know, it gives you a sense of familiarity with the world, like it's a real place, you know? And that's something I haven't been able to feel from any modern open world game. Sadly, Love Delic closed in 2000, only three years after releasing Moon. But you can see the legacy that left on the industry. Moon had three different designers, and after Love Delic closed, they all went off to do their own projects. From games like Chibi Robo and Captain Rainbow to... Little King's Story and Tingle's weird DS spin-off games? You can see the impact Moon and Love Delic left on the industry. 
Heck, Toby Fox even credited Moon as a major influence for Undertale. So if you made it all the way through to the end, and you want something different to play, maybe give Moon a chance. And thanks for watching.